Well, good morning, gathering. My name is Megan O'Brien. I'm one of the site pastors here, and I just want to add my welcome to the one that Danae just gave you, especially if you're new with us, though. I've been gone for a few weeks, and I've missed you all, but I've also, that means I haven't had a chance to meet some of you who are new, and I hope that I do get to do that after worship today. So at the risk of using an illustration that we all may be getting a little bit burned out on, can we just stop for a second and talk about the blues? <laughs> Seriously, though. All right, yeah, I'll take it. Yeah. What a fun couple of months it has been around here. The whole thing has movie script written all over it. In fact, it's almost too good to be true in some ways. And maybe it's the sociology major in me, but I see this whole other layer to it as well. Look at what happened over the last month with the Blues run in the postseason. Like so often happens with sports, it brought so many people together. People jumped on the bandwagon or stopped doing other things in their life just to be part of something bigger than themselves, something that brought a feeling of community, of togetherness, or even hope for our city. So we were scheduled to be out of town last weekend with some friends on vacation, but when they saw that the parade was scheduled for Saturday, they actually checked on us to make sure that we were still going on the trip. <laughs> it was a good question. We were torn about missing a historic, but also community-oriented and bonding event. All of us, naturally, internally, deep down, crave relationships, crave community and connection. Something like a momentum-building, cheer-inducing, parade-making playoff run by a hockey team can awaken us to that reality. So there's often a lot written about this in sports psychology, but actually this whole idea also stems from Genesis 1 in the Bible. We've spent a lot of time with this scripture over the last couple of months. The creation story found there gives us insight into how we were designed. It reveals that we were, be, we were created to be in relationship. We see from the beginning that God is a God of relationship. God is in relationship to the world that's created and to people, and, and we are created in God's image. God commands that humanity be in relationship with the earth, animals, and one another, as well as God. From the beginning, we were designed for relationship. I think many of us long for community or for quality family relationships, for trustworthy friends, because again, we were designed for that. The same goes for our relationship with God. We want depth. But all of that means we have to be intentional. Matt Fulmer talked last week about this idea that either we can be consumers or we can be creators. I think ultimately we often default to being consumers of relationship. Sure, we might do some work, we'll text our friends a funny meme, or we'll show up to family functions. We attend worship or maybe pray before bed. But ultimately, we consume the relationships that are defaulted to us, or the level of the relationship that's the easiest. In this series, we've been wanting to talk about what it means to create, and why that's important, and how it actually plays out. Last week, we talked about this idea from Genesis that we were created in God's image. That one essential thing about who we are is that we were created in the image of God. God created, so then if you do the math, we also are creative people. We are people who are called to create. Yet, so often we find reasons to avoid or stifle that, to begin to believe this maybe doesn't apply to us. Many of us don't even think we're creative type people. But in this series, we want to think about what it means to reclaim that creative intent, what it means to be co-creators with God. The underlying idea here is that we are all creative, but maybe we just need to begin to think outside of the box with what that word actually means. By tapping into this, it can also bring us closer to God and to the people that we are meant to be. One of the ways we can be challenged about this is realizing that there are many ways to create. So through this series, we wanted to break it down into thinking about creating with our head, with our heart, and with our hands. Creating with our heads or our minds means visioning things, strategizing, planning, inventing, storytelling, dreaming, communicating. But this week, I want us to think about what it means to create with our hearts. Reflecting on that Genesis story, how we were designed for relationship, it sets the stage for how we are to be creative with our hearts. So what does this look like? What does it mean to cultivate or create with our hearts? 
In the New Testament, there is a story in the Gospel of Luke that illustrates how this might look. It comes in Luke chapter 7, starting in verse 36. So let's read this. It says, one of the Pharisees invited Jesus to eat with him. After he entered the Pharisee's home, he took his place at the table. Meanwhile, a woman from the city, a sinner, discovered that Jesus was dining at the Pharisee's house. She brought perfumed oil in a vase made of alabaster. Standing behind him at his feet and crying, she began to wet his feet with her tears. She wiped them with her hair, kissed them, and poured the oil on them. When the Pharisee who had invited Jesus saw what was happening, he said to himself, if this man were a prophet, he would know what kind of woman is touching him. He would know that she is a sinner. Jesus replied, Simon, I have something to say to you. It goes on later in verse 44. Jesus turned to the woman and said to Simon, do you see this woman? When I entered your home, you didn't give me water for my feet, but she wet my feet with tears and wiped them with her hair. You didn't greet me with a kiss, but she hasn't stopped kissing my feet since I came in. You didn't anoint my head with oil, but she has poured perfumed oil on my feet. This is why I tell you that her many sins have been forgiven, so she has shown great love. The one who is forgiven little loves little. So there's a lot here, but what I think it shows are some characteristics of biblical hospitality and how we can begin to cultivate it. How we create with our hearts is to cultivate a spirit of hospitality. This idea is present throughout the Bible, and it offers a model for how we can begin to be creative, maybe in a different way. Just as we are consumers of relationship, I think we also have a tendency to consume hospitality. Think about it. We have an entire industry built around hospitality. But hospitality is not an industry. It's an attitude. It's a condition of the heart. I think it is one that can apply to all areas of our lives, too, to all of our relationships. So what I think this story in Luke teaches us first is that hospitality is other-focused or selfless. The contrast of Simon and the woman is detailed by Jesus. But one of the things that stands out the most is how true hospitality is not selfish, but is about the treatment of the other person. The best way to stop being consumers of relationship and begin to create it is to focus on the other person, their needs, desires, emotions, or experience. It means sacrificing our own comfort for another's. The woman saw a need, she, and probably everyone else in the room, noticed that Jesus had not been properly greeted and served, and she responded to that need. Many of you know one of the big parts of my job here at The Gathering over the years has been working with our hospitality teams. If you've ever served on one of these teams with me, you know that you'll often be asked to push yourself aside for the sake of other people, especially new people. That means arriving early to make coffee or parking across the street and giving Lieutenant Dan something to do so that a guest can park in the parking lot. The first step to creating with our hearts is to think about other people, to create space for other people. But hospitality, creating space, thinking of others, is not just about strangers or groups of people. I want us to think about this with our family. What does it mean to put other people before ourselves? What does this look like for friends or coworkers? How does this play out in a church or how we relate to others in our neighborhoods? Second, building on that, hospitality is also extravagant. It needs to go beyond the basics. I think the key part of that word extravagant is extra. When we create with our hearts, we push the limits of relationship. It means not just accepting the relationships for what they are, but pushing them. It means being intentional or thoughtful. So often, we default to relationships as they are or just meet the status quo of what we think they can be. We accept our family dynamics for how they've always been, or we think of our coworkers or our neighbors just as acquaintances. This is where effort comes in. Creating requires energy, effort, and sometimes small or big gestures. It requires something extra. For Jesus' era, the things that Simon failed to do, wash Jesus' feet when he entered, anoint him or greet him properly, those were basic hospitality elements. By comparison, the woman was extravagant. She did something extra. She didn't just go grab the bowl of water by the door that Simon didn't use or just give Jesus a simple kiss of greeting on the cheek. It was really about the details. 
In our Luke story too, it wasn't that the woman threw another party down the street for Jesus that had more people or more food. That was not what made her actions extravagant as we might think of it. It was that she took what she had and used it for someone else. She used all her oil, her own hair and tears, but it was all that she had. That made it extravagant. It was how she did it. It was in the details. So my family is in the middle of planning a Disney vacation for this fall. It made me start reflecting on my past trips to Disney World and why I'm so excited to go back and why I'm excited to share it with my family. Sure, I'm looking forward to the unique rides, but that's not really what makes the trips magical. It was arriving at my resort and finding my luggage was already waiting for me inside the room. It was getting a pink wristband with my name on it and being able to use it to unlock my hotel room door, pay for treats, and get me into rides all at the same time. It was about wearing a button that said it was my birthday and having everyone tell me happy birthday, or wearing my marathon race medals and having cast members and Disney characters congratulate me. It was even having a Mickey Mouse-shaped pretzel. <laughs> Seriously, I love pretzels. <laughs> it's because if any of you have ever done a Disney vacation, you know this. They are well known for their magic, as people call it. I think that's just a really fun way to describe their hospitality. Disney's model is built on constantly going above and beyond in the details. It is in the little things. Sure, they have some awesome over-the-top things to see and do, but most people will tell you that's not where the magic happens. They want you to feel like they've thought of everything, to feel special, to feel like a princess or a prince, to be cared for. And it worked for me. I felt cared for and special when I visited. They go to extravagance all the time. Creating with our hearts means being willing to put in time, effort, or just thought. It means pushing beyond the basics, just doing a little bit extra. It means not accepting the basic relationships, but asking, what's the potential here? Why is, how is it that I could make this better, make it more, make it special? Next, one of the biggest ways we can show hospitality is being open and vulnerable ourselves or taking risks. The woman in the Luke passage put her entire reputation on the line and was called out for it in public, but she was willing to do it for Jesus. Creating with our hearts means we have to give our hearts, and which is where it gets risky. I think we struggle with this for many reasons. Mainly, we believe the lie that we can do life on our own. I think deep down we know we were created for relationship. We seek community, we look for connection. However, despite being created for relationship, we often stop short of living this out. Instead, we now live in a sometimes fiercely independent culture that values personal victory gain and self-made triumphs. There's a pervasive lie that says needing others is weakness. But back to our origin story. In Genesis chapter two, we get a retelling of the creation story. God here is really concerned about relationships, worried immediately about human success and the tasks of life and the work that needs to be done. So it says in verse 18, then the Lord God said, it's not good that the human is alone. The anecdote for being about the work of creation first was for God to create a human and then to realize that human needed another human. That independence was not the goal, relationship was. We are designed to go through life, to do our work, to be productive, to create together, not alone. Creating with our hearts, cultivating hospitality means realizing we have to take risks, open up to others, show we need others, and then hope for the same. But it also means we do all of those things. We risk our resources and our reputations, our emotions and our thoughts, no matter the cost. I still remember to this day, the day that I said I love you to my aunt for the first time. For so long, I had told myself, our family just doesn't do that. But by opening up just a little bit, saying just a couple of words, the dynamics of our family changed. We've had to rely on each other a lot the last few years, and it's essential that we risk being vulnerable with one another. That shifted everything and opened up new possibilities and levels of relationship. Creating with the heart means opening up our hearts. And cult cultivating a relationship as a way to create with our hearts is indeed selfless, extravagant, and risky. It's about others. But I think the final thing hospitality requires of us is a readiness to be changed. Relationships are not one-sided. And the reason we were created for them is so that they can bless our lives. 
Creating with our hearts is not going to just change others, change our environments, our families, our friends, our colleagues, our church, but us too. We don't do it for the blessing, but we are blessed nonetheless. We are changed, we are shaped, we become closer to God and others through hospitality. The woman who anointed Jesus, it says in the story, showed great love. And for that, her sins were forgiven. She was given new life, a new start, blessings, healing, and hope from Jesus because of her acts of hospitality and love. Anytime we spend time and energy in cultivating relationships, we are changed. God offers us relationship, not because it's helpful to God, but because God knows it's going to be a blessing for us, providing hope or forgiveness or a new start. When we open our hearts to others, we are often surprised by what we receive in return. So the question becomes, are you ready for change? Or are you looking for change in your relationships with God or your relationship with others? Then begin to create with your heart. Offer hospitality and see what growth comes about. How following Jesus will take on new depth. How you experience new things, find new perspective, learn to love in new ways. When we create with our hearts, our hearts are changed. This series is about tapping into the creative potential, the creative capacity that we all have. When we remember that we are created in God's image and our God is a creative God, then we have the tools as well as the directive to create. Part of that is believing and remembering we are called to be in relationship. It's in our DNA. And so we are called to create with our hearts, to design space, to connect with others and with God. One main way we can do that is cultivate this attitude of hospitality. So I'd ask you, first, where are you thinking of others before yourself? Maybe that means extending an invitation to lunch for the new coworker or, or joining a kids ministry or hospitality team here. Think about where you're giving up your own needs for the other people. Secondly, how are you being extravagant, going the extra step or thinking of details to show hospitality? Whether that means calling instead of texting or cooking a meal for a neighbor, maybe learning someone's name at church, offering to host an event at your house, or just using whatever resources you have to provide love and care for someone, that is being extravagant. That is showing God's love in an extra way. Next where are you risking something or opening up your heart? Who needs to hear that you love them, needs to be cared for, listened to, or heard? Maybe that means sharing your home or your story or your energy or your money. It means investing and sacrificing something of yourself. And then finally, how open are you to growth, change, or God's blessings? What do you need to do? How can you cultivate your own heart so that you can be ready to create with it? Maybe that's getting time in prayer or getting counsel from someone. Maybe that means learning to forgive so that you are forgiven. I don't always have a specific ask for you all, but I'm gonna do that today. I'm gonna encourage you to pray about something. Next week, we're gonna begin to ask you to be core group hosts this fall. For those of you that don't know, core groups are small groups of people that meet weekly to study scripture, reflect on the sermon. And we're gonna talk about what this means next week, but I want you all to pray about it. All of you, think about whether God may be asking you to cultivate hospitality, to create with your hearts by offering yourself to be a host for six weeks this fall, practicing selfless, extravagant, risky hospitality, and knowing that God will indeed show up and change other people and you in the process. We are created in God's image and God created with God's heart. God models hospitality for us and being selfless for us, extravagant in love for us and risking it all in Jesus for us even when we didn't deserve it so that we can be blessed. May we live into our creative call and be co-creators with God in that ongoing work. Let's pray. God, I thank you first that you are a creative God and that you created us in your image. God, we don't always take that seriously. We fall short of realizing the potential that we have. God, I pray today that you begin to release us from some of the things holding us back. God, I pray that you cultivate in us an attitude of love and hospitality and generosity for other people. God, give us wisdom in our relationships. Give us insight to see where there is potential for more. And then give us courage to act 
being risky, being extravagant, and showing that we love you by loving others. We pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen.